ABWE missionaries that you have supported over the years, but I just want to start off this morning uh, by playing a video, and some of you may have seen it before, but some of you may be new to ABWE, and I never want to pass up the opportunity for you to learn about ABWE as an organization and some of the things that God is doing through ABWE around the world. have likely never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And billions more who've heard of him are still lost. Christ is saving a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And now he is inviting every believer to play their part in his mission. At ABWE, we feel the enormity and weight of that task. That's why we have dedicated our lives to helping ordinary men and women just like you discover their role in the Great Commission. For almost 100 years, we've been helping local churches equip and send gospel workers by training, supporting, and providing the care they need for the long haul. We are a family of almost a thousand missionaries reaching more than 80 countries, and we want to help you faithfully use the gifts God has given you to reach the nations. The Great Commission isn't for a select few. God is inviting all of us to pray Send, give, go. Find your role at abwe.org. So my path to ABWE was not a traditional path. Uh, my wife and I actually both grew up in uh, Christian homes. Uh, we went to church all the time, right? Some of you may remember Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, both of our parents actually worked at various times, custodial. So sometimes we were in church even when the church doors weren't opened. We were still in church. Um, and my wife came to know the Lord at an early age. I came to know the Lord when I was about 11 years old. My dad was in the Navy, and so we moved all across the country. Uh, I actually started attending an Awana program, and after memorizing God's Word on a weekly basis, recognized that going to church wasn't going to save me, having godly parents wasn't going to save me. The only thing that would save me from my sin was trusting in what Jesus Christ had done for me on the cross and entrusting in Him alone. And so when I was ten and a half years old, I trusted Christ as my Savior, and shortly after that, recognized that God's desire for me was to be in full-time ministry. Uh, my dad, again, because he was in the Navy, we moved to Iceland. I lived for four and a half years in Iceland. If you want to know more about that, uh, Karen can tell you. I don't know if she's in here or not, but Karen actually would come and visit us in Iceland. Um, we won't talk about all of the things that we did. We were teenagers at the time. Okay? But, uh, and I, you know, some of the, we, I was here on Wednesday night with the tea and tears and Sparkies, and I said, I'm not going to tell you any stories about Mrs. G, because most of those stories also involve me, and so we're not going to go there, but, uh, but God used that time in my life, even living overseas, recognizing now the, the impact of living cross-culturally, and the impact that that makes on families and young people, um, and I ended up going to Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, it's where I met my wife. Uh, we ended up getting married, and God gave us uh, four wonderful children. Did it click? Maybe. There they are. So we have four wonderful children, and guess what? We now have three grandchildren. And so we're in the grandchildren phase of life, and uh, tomorrow we'll actually be stopping by to visit a few of those. And so we uh, enjoy spending time with our grandkids as we, as we have opportunities one of the things that's a joy to us, though, is to see our young people walk in truth, right? As we see our young people grow up serving in their local churches, one of our, one of our kids serves on staff at his church, another one, they serve in their local church faithfully with their children's ministry, 
and the other two are active in, the, in local churches as well. And so we're just thankful for the opportunity that we have had in our ministry. But God gave us over 30 years being involved in local church ministry. Uh, I was a pastor alongside the sister church with Pastor Bill in Columbus. Prior to that, pastored a church in Pennsylvania. And then God directed us. As I mentioned, I had gotten saved through the Iwana ministry. We ended up becoming Iwana missionaries in eastern Virginia and uh, actually worked with about 1,500 churches from Maryland down through South Carolina. And uh, God just gave us a desire and a burden for shepherding and discipling. And 2 Timothy 2.2 tells us, tells us this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. God has always given me a burden to pass on truths to that next generation. And so that way they can take those biblical truths and pass that on to the next generation. So that way they could take those truths and pass that on to the next generation. You know, and we, and we look at that over and over again throughout Scripture. We do so many things that we teach young people. That we teach even as we get older, young people, somehow they, they look, you know, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, it's like they just look so young, right? And so it's like young people, you know, when I was, when I was a youth pastor and I first started in ministry, you know, those were like those, those 15-year-olds and those 10-year-olds. Now that I'm in my 50s, those young are like, those, those young people are like in their 30s and 40s even and so it's like that that young people definition kind of changes over the years but what are we teaching and passing on to that next generation and i'm oftentimes reminded of the passage in deuteronomy uh, deuteronomy 32 where moses is the the children of israel are about ready to pass into the promised land and moses gathers all the children of israel and he reminds them of all the things that God has done throughout their history and leading them through the wilderness. And he gets to the end, and in uh, verse 34, says this, Moses, Deuteronomy 32, uh, 44, Moses came and recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua the son of Nun. And when Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take heart, to all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of your law. For this is no empty word for you, but your very life. There's a lot of things that we enjoy. There's a lot of things that we do. There's a lot of things that we pass on to the next generation. But the most important thing are the truths from God's Word. The Gospel. How do we serve people? How do we make sure, how do we live the Gospel? And so that has always been a burden for my wife and I throughout our years of ministry. And when we came to the end of our time with Awana serving as missionaries, we were like, what's God have for us next? And Ron Washer reached out and said, I have an idea. If any of you know Ron, Ron has lots of ideas, and Ron's like, I have an idea of a new position that I'd, like, that I'd like you to step into, and that was serving the role as the Africa coordinator, and my wife and I still weren't sure how we wanted to move forward, but as we learned about ABWE and who they were, and we've known ABWE our whole lives, we've always known ABWE missionaries, but they had a new president that was kind of re recasting some vision and some purposes, and it was like, as these things started rolling out, and we heard the vision statement to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying leaders, churches, and mission movements among every people group, as we heard their core values, my wife and I just sat there and was like, this is where God wants us to be. And how do we fit in to Africa? Because some of you may ask, Ken, how long have you served in Africa? My answer is, we didn't. 
But what we do know is this. The same God that people need to hear about in Africa is the same God that we serve right here, that you serve right here in Portage, Michigan. The truths from God's Word that people in Africa, that even the missionaries in Africa need to hear are the same truths that we need to hear right here in our own lives. And so we stepped into this role, and our role really consists of a couple of different things. Well, let, I forgot. I was going to share you a little bit about the history of ABW in Africa. That actually started in 1973. There are, we've been in there for now 50 years, so this coming May, there's a big celebration that's going to be taking place in Togo about the ministry that has gone on there for 50 years. Today we have over 150 missionaries currently ser serving in the countries that, that we are engaged in. Those are 10 different countries that we serve. And we actually have 25 outside of that 150. There's another 25 that are currently in a pre-field process state. And that last number, 20, we have an additional 20 that have started some type of application with us. So we are looking at almost 200 people that we minister to that are serving in Africa. And our role as the Africa coordinator boils down to this. We come alongside of churches and missionaries that are being sent to reach Africa's unreached. And how do we do that? Well, we end up providing what we refer to as pre-field member care. So we come alongside of missionaries during that first several year process as they're raising their support we encourage them we coach them on best ways to interact with churches to figure out because the the pre-field process can be challenging for some we also come alongside of church there are some churches that do an excellent job an excellent job of sending out missionaries there are some churches that it almost seems like an annual thing that there, there's another missionary that they're sending out. And there's another missionary that they're sending out. There is ongoing discipleship that's happening at multiple levels throughout their church. And they are always sending out missionaries. There are other churches that this year, through ABWE, we have 16 churches that have never sent out a missionary before. This is the first time that they're ever sending out a missionary. How much experience do they have in sending out a missionary? They, they're like, what, what do we do? What, is this, what does this look like? We've never been in this position before. We have no idea what it looks like to send a missionary overseas. How do we continue to care for those missionaries? What does that shepherding and discipling process look like? And why is this important? Because this is, this is really important as you think about the type of ministry that we do. Why is this important? How many, of you, how many of you have ever lost a loved one? Probably most of you in here have. How many of you have ever had a baby? All the guys should not be raising their hands. <laughs> Who normally ministers to you in those types of situations? Sometimes you have family. A lot of times, though, people in the church, right? Have any of you ever received a meal from somebody in your church? Have any of you ever been discouraged and somebody in the church reached out to you to encourage you? Have any of you ever been struggling with a sin? And somebody in the church, thank you, I saw that hand, thank you. Any of you ever struggle with a sin and somebody in the church reaches out to admonish you and to encourage you and to help you in the right direction? Most of us, when those types of situations happen, we, we depend on people within our local churches to help us. It's why biblical community is so important in our lives. So a missionary grows up in your church, they've been discipled, they're on fire for the Lord. You're like, this, this individual's like, I feel God is calling me to the mission field. And you as a church are excited and you want to send them and they go to the mission field. And they arrive in this culture that they've never been to long term. They settle in. They're like, 
They have a fight with their wife, or their spouse, I should say. And this little sin starts to grow. And it gets a little worse, and it gets a little worse. And normally the people that are within their body, within their community, within their church, come alongside of them and they recognize, hey, I'm noticing something's going on. But these missionaries are a little bit more isolated. They don't have the same community. Three years later, these missionaries are off the field. Some missionaries come off the field and they never even go to church again. 70% of missionaries leave the field in the first five years, and they did so because of a, of a preventable reason. Sin crept in, and it wasn't dealt with, and it became catastrophic, and those missionaries needed to leave the field. That's why my wife and I attempt to do what we do. There's nothing special about Ken and Eileen Loro. The only thing that we really try to do is remind these missionaries of what God's Word says and help redirect them back to the path that they're directed on. And so the biggest bulk of our ministry really is working with these pre-fielders, helping them again to understand who God is, how to help them in their walk with the Lord, to minister to local churches that want to send and to do a good job. And so I wanted to just share with you some of our pre-fielders that we're currently working with. So these are a few of our pre-fielders. This last week, um, we have had the privilege of meeting with several of them. Uh, tomorrow morning, on our way out of Michigan, we're going to be meeting with uh, Jordan and Jessica, because they live over near Detroit, and so we're going to be visiting them on our way out. And what we really do during their, during their pre-field ministry is we work, and every month I meet with these missionaries because I want to build a relationship with them so that way when there is an issue that comes up in their life, they're ready to talk. Because if the first time that they ever have a conversation with me is after they start to struggle with something in their life, how open are they going to want to be with me? They're not. People like to talk to people that they have a relationship with and are willing to hear things from people that they have a relationship with. And so we work with these pre-fielders. You see underneath there where they're going. Uh, ben and Sarah are heading to Uganda. Andrew and Rebecca are going to be in Ghana. Uh, Jordan and Jessica are going to Benin, which is a new field that we're looking to open when they go. Caleb and Hannah, uh, they're going to Durban. We actually have another slide here, missionaries. Again, Moyo uh, in uh, Uganda, which is actually a wonderful opportunity uh, there is a, a church, um, a, I should say not church, but a pastoral training center that is a kilometer from the Sudan border, from the South Sudan border. Uh, missionaries there uh, were, were getting older. They were not with ABWE. They were solo missionaries. They've been there for over 10 years, 15 years. They're like, we're not going to be able to do this much longer. And we need to find somebody who can carry on this ministry. And so they started searching around, and they came across ABWE, and they're like, wow, ABWE, they're like, they are so like-minded with us. And so now we have two missionaries that are heading there to do pastoral training. They do some medical outreaches. They're reaching the last unreached people group in Uganda, the Oringa people. Um, they go up into the mountains to... When you... Jacob Lee, who's not a prefielder, he's on the, When you think of a missionary out in the jungle, out in the, I shouldn't say jungle, out in the bush of Africa, Jacob Lee is that guy. He has a Land Rover. He gets up on top of his Land Rover. He has a megaphone. He's got a hat. Everybody knows Jacob because he's the guy who wears the hat. <laughs> sharing the gospel all over. And, and people are coming to know the Lord. And so it is, it is a joy for my wife and I to be able to partner with people that are serving in these countries, um, reaching unreached people. Both uh, Daniel and Anya and Fred and Lydia are medical doctors. They're going to the hospital there in Togo. And Justin and Megan are looking at the aviation ministry uh, that has been going on 
in Togo. And so those are some of the pre-fielders that we work with. Again, we meet with them every month. I would ask that you pray for them. Uh, it is, it is uh, I was talking with Pastor, with Pastor Nichols just this morning. Raising support today is, in a, is, a, is a different culture than it was 20, 30 years ago. Missionaries would come out, they would go to churches, pastors would have Wednesday nights and they'd have Sunday night opportunities for, for missionaries to come. Today, the climate is just different. And it is challenging for missionaries to get into churches. And, and I understand that having been a pastor, churches, first of all, after COVID, don't have services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. So when is a missionary going to speak? Sunday morning. Pastors don't normally like to give up their pulpit on Sunday morning because this is the one time. Missionaries may get 10 to 15 minutes to share their ministry. And so it is, it is challenging for these missionaries to raise support. When we were in Benin uh, back in May, my wife and I, uh, we were meeting with Pastor Laurent, and as we sat down with him, uh, he asked us, he said, why is it so hard for missionaries to come to Africa? I was like, well, he said to get missionaries to come to Africa. And I said, well, he said, actually, we have quite a few missionaries that want to go. It's just challenging to, for them to be able to raise the support for them to be able to get there. So I would ask that you, that you pray. We have a new class uh, in two weeks that, uh, that I have the opportunity to be involved in the missionary orientation class. We have nine of those that are participating in that heading to Africa. And so we've been working with around 20-something. There's 16 here that, that are represented on these slides. But there's another nine that we're going to start ministering to um, in, just a few, in just a few weeks here because they're coming on with us. So pray for them. It's a challenging time. And they have a heart to get to the field. And so we want to be able to come alongside of their churches. The other thing that we've, that we've been working at is we're, we're updating the Sending Church training seminar that we do. And so Brad Winkler, I don't, some of you know him, some of you don't. Brad Winkler uh, used to be the pre-field department director at ABWE. Now he is over our member care division. And so he will oftentimes, uh, he gets asked a couple of times a year to go to a church and do the Sending Church, Sustaining Church workshop, which is about a four-hour workshop, each one of those. Churches struggle to have an eight-hour workshop done anymore. And so... We're trying to find ways for us to be able to, digi to digitalize that. How do we make that reproducible? How do we make that so more than just Brad can do that? And so now I, I'm doing that training as well. But how do we get others engaged in that process? And how do we make it more manageable for, for churches today, especially in our digital age? How do we help the churches that we're working with know how to send their missionaries and send them well? Again, I talked earlier, some churches do an excellent job of that. Other churches really struggle in doing that. So the other thing that we do, and these things aren't necessarily as flashy, but we do a lot of, of recruitment and mobilization. Mobilization is a fancy word for we try to get missionaries that are interested in going to the field and help them identify what field is going to be best for them. Sometimes people come to us and they're like, this is, I want to go to Togo. And so we'll sit down and we'll talk with them about the gifts that they have, how God has equipped them, is their church in doctrinal alignment with us, is their church willing to send them to this country that they're interested in going in. We have the process that they go through, doctrinal interview, all of those things um, that we want to help them to figure out. Sometimes people come to us and they're like, this is our giftedness, and we'll go anywhere. We, we don't know where, we, where God wants us to serve. And so we'll talk to them about the opportunities that there are to serve. And so some of the fields I mentioned earlier that we're currently in 10 different fields. And so Benin is one of our new countries. The, the Jordan and Jessica are going to be heading there. Um, pastor Laurent is the pastor that I, was, that I mentioned just a minute ago that asked us about missionaries going there. He has moved to... Uh, I'm not very good at pronouncing names in French. Naditangu. 
is the name of the city. And uh, they've, they've established a new church plant there. And he has a vision that he's cast to plant churches at four different spots around the city because they are currently the only uh, Bible-believing church in the city. And so trying to get, they're raising up other people within the church, but they're also looking for assistance to come alongside them as they, as they plant these churches in the northern section of, of Benin. Cameroon, we actually have one uh, missionary. She is a Canadian female who works with us. Um, she's a medical doctor. And when I had the opportunity to meet and to get engaged with her, it took on a whole new weight to me of what we do as Africa leadership. Because Dr. Lori is serving in an area where there's uprisings all around her all the time. There's car bombings between the hospital and the, and the local city. There's hijackings that take place. Lori's in her mid-60s. She's a single woman. And it's like the weight of making a decision to approve somebody to go into a field that you know that they could die. And I remember being on that call with her and she's saying, if the Lord takes me, so be it. But this is where God has called me to serve and I want to serve. And these are the type of people that we have the opportunity to minister to, to encourage, because they experience hardships while they're serving. The Gambia has had a history with ABWE. Both the Gambia and Ghana um, my wife and I had the opportunity to visit there this last May, and as we were there, there are, there are exciting new ministries that are being born and, and, and growing, and there's enthusiasm and excitement about these things, and it's like, wow, look at what God is doing. And then you go to some other fields, like the Gambia and, and Ghana, and it's like at one time in the Gambia there, was, there were 10 missionaries, and in Ghana there were 16 and in the Gambia today, there's two. And in Ghana, there's none. And it's like these works that once were thriving and flourishing have now gone away. And it, and it kind of broke our hearts as we were there on these, at these ministry centers and talking with some of the locals. And uh, when we were in, in the Gambia, one of, I, learned a, I learned one of the local words, um, and that was tubab. Tubab means white person. And so we heard all the kids yelling as we were walking through town, Tubab, Tubab. <laughs> and my wife was like, that's kind of like stranger danger, right? We teach our kids, when you see somebody you don't know, just tell her, stranger danger, stranger danger. So that way all the kids know, hey, stay away from that person. But they were yelling, Tubab, Tubab, as we walk through this town. And there's, there's all these people that, that need to hear the gospel. And there's, people are just struggling to get there to be able to share. We're also uh, working in, in both the Gambia and in Ghana and also in Togo. Uh, if you go by our booth out in the, out in the fellowship hall, there's a, there's a sign that says Fulani. And one of the, the people groups there is the Fulani. And they, they don't really, they're, they're nomadic people. They're cattle herders traditionally. And so they actually spread across that section of, of Western Africa. So they're in northern Togo, they're in northern Benin, they're in Burkina Faso, they go all the way over to the Gambia. And so one of the projects that we're, that we're looking at doing is in the Gambia actually developing a Fulani training center uh, to train people that are interested in ministering to the Fulani to actually have them start to learn Fulani culture and the Fulani language, but one of the things that we're trying, that we're in the process right now of evaluating is, is the Fulani that they speak there the same as the Fulani that they speak in Togo, in Ghana, because if it's not, then that strategy isn't going to be as effective. So these are some of the fields that, that we are currently engaged in. I know you guys know a lot about Togo because of your history with, with several of the missionaries that work there. Both my wife and I have had opportunities to visit those fields a couple of times, uh, to visit the hospitals, 
um, that are doing some tremendous work to reach people. The thing that, that even we're constantly learning more and more about what's going on. And the thing to me that is amazing with our, with our medical facilities is this. So every, you guys already know, every patient that comes to one of the hospitals hears the gospel. But what's really cool about this is when you go to the hospital, right, they used to do it with paper, which is how they still do it in Togo. So you have your chart, right? And so the doctor comes, what does he do? He looks at your chart. Are you ever allowed to see your chart, by the way? No, you're not allowed to look at your chart. But they take your chart, they flip it open, they read. They, they see what's, what's going on with you. They know, and then they kind of look through. So that way they know how to treat you. In the hospitals, the first sheet is your spiritual inventory. So the first thing that anybody that's working with any one of the patients that they see is, this is the last conversation that somebody had. And it kind of tracks. Oh, they talked about Abraham, or not Abraham, they talked about Adam and Eve. Oh, they, they had this conversation about sin. Oh, they talked about how Jesus died for their sin. Whatever that last conversation was, they're tracking that. So as that new medical person steps in there, they're able to look at that chart and they know these are the things that this, that this patient has already heard, so that way then we can continue on the conversation instead of always repeating the same things. And so to me, that was just like, that's a really great idea because sometimes people don't know what other people have already talked to them about. And here's a way of putting that right in their medical charts to track all that information. I would encourage you as, we, as, as you consider what it is as far as your role in fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, that first video talked about whether it's, whether it's going, whether it's sending, what is, what is your role? Sometimes, for some of you, that might be that God calls you to serve in another country. For some of you, that might be supporting missions. For some of you, that might even mean doing a short-term trip. I would encourage you, we have some, some things at our, at our table, a couple things that I want to encourage you about. Is Number one is to pray. pray. Every one of you can pray. Whether you give, whether you send, whether you go, everybody can pray. And so we have a card on our table that says 938. And Matthew 938 says, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into the harvest field. And so my alarm actually just went off because I felt it in my pocket because it's 938. And I didn't plan that. Um... But I'm going to stop just for a moment and pray. Lord, we know that there are many around the world that need to hear the gospel. And Lord, I know that it is the prayer of, of this church and it is the prayer of my heart that you would send forth laborers into your harvest field. Lord, we know that you are working and Lord, we need laborers. And so, Lord, would you raise up laborers to go into your harvest field. In Jesus' name, amen. What that 938 initiative is really is just to set your alarm for 938 and just pray. It can be a long prayer, it can be a short prayer, it's up to you, but just stop and pray for a moment that God would send forth laborers into his harvest field. The fields are white, ready to harvest. And I can tell you, in Africa, people are receptive to the gospel. They are hungry for the gospel. But they need people that are willing to go and tell them the gospel. The other thing on our card, is, or at our table, is we have a demo card. Demo is a 24-hour introduction to ABWE, who they are, what we're all about. Uh, it costs you 20 bucks. Um, I was telling uh, Pastor Ryan last night a little bit about, hey, where can you get it for 20 bucks, a date? I mean, two days? They put you up for two nights in a hotel. They give you, we have a chef there that works at, the, at ABWE's home office. You get two nights in a hotel, you get all your meals, and you can learn about what God is doing around the world through ABWE. I would encourage you, learn. So you might have young people in your church. Some of you as parents, might be like, my child is interested in learning more about missions. 
What, how can, is, is ABWE an opportunity for them? Where might they be able to serve? You know, we mentioned in the video, there's over, we're, ABWE is in over 80 countries all around the world. We work in Africa. But there are, there are countries all around the world that need to hear the gospel. So I'd encourage you, stop by our table out there. We have a, we have a newsletter sign-up list. We'd love for you, if you're interested in knowing more about what we do, uh, to, to get updates from us, sign up about that. We would love to, to share that with you. The last thing that, that, that our role entails is fundraising. How many of you in here, I'm just curious, because this, this would be interesting, because Ron has had a long history with this church, Ron Washer. How many of you get his Africa Projects email? So there's about 15 to 20 of you that get that. So as was mentioned earlier, Ron has uh, stepped back from his role as being, from being the executive director for Africa. Andy Kirby is the new executive director, effective September 1. And so Andy has said, hey, Ron's been doing this for a long time. We don't want to let this go. Ken, you get to do the newsletter. <laughs> so I'm now working with Ron. Ron is, Ron is still out mobilizing. He's still trying to be aware of projects that are going on. But one of the things that's been added to my plate is, Ken, we need to let people know that have historically been praying for, been giving to projects that our missionaries are engaged in to know what's going on. And so I, I'm now taking that up as well. And so that's what, when we talk about what does it mean to be the Africa coordinator, we let people know these are the, these are the projects that are currently going on that, you know, whether it's this church needs to be built, it needs funds to be built, whether it's this missionary needs a new vehicle, whether it's this radio needs this, whether it's a hospital needs $13 million to renovate. You know, we have $2,000 projects, we have $13 million projects. But letting people know these are the projects that are currently going on. I want to share with you one project that we actually just started last week because it's the project that I started. <laughs> and that is the pre-field care retreat. So we are now going to do, uh, once a year is the, is the intention, but for our pre-fielders, we're going to have a pre-field retreat for them to come to for a, basically a weekend, a Friday through Sunday weekend, where we're going to teach them some valuable things to help them to prepare to go to the field. One of the things that my wife and I believe very deeply is this. There are, there are two things that will destroy any missionaries, missionary couple's ministry on the field. Number one is they neglect their walk with the Lord, their, in, their, their own personal walk with the Lord. And number two, marital discord. You can be a great, you can be a great missionary but if you have discord in your home, it is going to manifest itself to the point that it becomes critical for you to come off the field. And so we want to address some of those issues before they get to the field. And so we're now raising funds to basically pay for that. Every year it'll cost us about $2,500. Um, and so we're, we're now in the process of raising the funds to cover that pre-field retreat. And for Pastor Bill, Greg and Connie are the ones that are helping us do that, Bernard. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. That's what, that's what we ask that you continue to pray for us about. We do fundraising, we do recruiting and mobiliza mobilizing, but the biggest role that we do is in that pre-field care. So things that we're currently doing that we would ask that you pray for us about, number one is that pre-field retreat. We're in the process currently. That's going to be coming up in February. And so we're getting everybody who's able to come. We also want to strengthen those relationships with those new and existing pre-fielders. They're all at different stages of their ministry. Those eight that I showed you, some of them have significant issues that they're dealing with. Some of them are, uh, they turned 40 this year, and they're all excited. They're going, they've, been in, they've been in full-time ministry for a number of years. They've, God's called them to the field. They're going to the field. 40 years old, and she's pregnant. 
And so there's a curveball. And dealing with, you know, this pregnancy, they're excited and they just had a, they've had all boys and they had their first daughter born. But guess what? That changes the dynamic of that family, doesn't it? Because the other thing that they have is they have two boys that are married. So there's a big gap between their kids. And so just dealing with the, the emotion that sometimes come along with that. And what does God's word say about how they're, how they're guiding and directing their family through that process? We're updating the sending church training, which I already talked to you about. And then we also are identifying ministry partners. Part of our role is faith supported. And so we need both churches and individuals that are willing to, to partner with us in order for us to do what we do. And so we thank you for the opportunity that we've had today to just come and share. And I have another video that I'd like to show you. Then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. For nearly 100 years, the ABWE Global Family of Ministries has supported the local church in equipping and sending ambassadors for Christ to the ends of the earth. From humble beginnings in the Philippines to doing mission work in over 84 countries today, our goal has remained the same, to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying leaders, churches, and missions movements amongst every people, all for the sake of the gospel. Jesus commanded to go and make disciples of all nations, and this drives us to action, to bring light to the lost, the needy, and the unreached. We exist to partner with and mobilize the church, to reach the nations with the gospel, equip nationals to do gospel-centered work, train disciple-makers, and help believers participate in missions. So whether you pray for missionaries, support missions through sacrificial giving, send new workers to the field through your church, or sense a call to go yourself, every Christian and every church has a role in the Great Commission. Time is short. Eternity matters. Join us. Time is short. Eternity matters. The things that you're passing on to the next generation, what are those things? Are they a love for sports? Are they a love for music? Is it a, is it a quest for knowledge? Or is it about the things that the Lord has done? Judges 2.10 is one of the scariest verses in Scripture to me. It says, And there arose after Joshua went in, and Joshua, Joshua went in with the children of Israel into the Promised Land, and Joshua passed away. It says, And there arose up another generation that did not know any of the things that God had done. How quickly, how quickly that can happen. Please, remember, even here, you might think missions is around the world, and it takes place around the world. But Acts 1.8 reminds us that it starts here. What are you doing? What are you doing to help reach others? What are you doing to help make sure that next generation knows and understands the truths from God's Word? I'd ask that you would partner with us, just like Paul said there at the very end of that. Whether that's going, praying, giving, whatever God lays on your heart in fulfilling the Great Commission. Don't be lax in following what it is that God has said for you to do. It's easy to come to church and walk out the door and not allow God's word or God's people to make a difference in your life. It's easy to do that. 
it's hard to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and to say, I will change. Pastor Kenoyer, the pastor that I worked with in Columbus, used to always say, preaching puts you on the spot of saying yes or no to God. When you come to church and God, His Holy Spirit convicts you, maybe it's, you're going to be here today, you're going to hear from other missionaries, and you're going to be like, God wants me to go. Are you going to go? Are you just going to kind of sit on it and not do anything? Whatever that is, I would encourage you to follow God's prompting and God's leading in your heart. We're going to be at the table later on today. Please come by. We'd be happy to talk to you, share with you personally. I look forward to seeing you guys tonight. I hear that it's going to be great. We're praying that it doesn't rain, right? We're praying for no rain. One of our missionaries this week reminded us, prayer works. We went to Uganda. They were doing this pastoral training. Mud ground. He was like, if it rains, this is going to be a disaster. So the church group that he was with, they all started praying that God, that God would hold off the rain. Guess what? Five kilometers from the, from the training center, it was pouring. All of a sudden, it stopped raining. The ground where the training center was, totally dry. Everywhere else around had been raining, but it didn't rain there. After the training was over, it rained. <laughs> and the missionary that we talked to says, you know what, I, I know prayer works, but when you see it, it's like, wow, prayer works. And I want to encourage you today. Prayer works. Pray for us. Thank you, Pastor Bill.